So we want to get into this lecture on the threefold flame and your identity. And I want to point out to you, first of all, a very gross concept that most people have of themselves. They somehow or other think of themselves as a physical being. And because we live in a physical body, we are constantly oppressed or depressed or in some cases inspired by the way that body functions. If it functions poorly, we somehow or other feel that we're not too happy about it all. But if the body functions very well and we're vibrant with good health and feel good most of the time, we don't mind identifying with this body. In fact, people will say they rather like it. They paint it up, they powder it up, they pamper it, they trim its hair, fingernails, and do a lot of things to it to make it look better, and mainly they dress it in very good apparel. I think this is a fine idea. It makes life interesting. But in actuality, this body is so very little a part of the total man. It's really, as uh, Krishnamurti said in his At the Feet of the Master, says the body is your horse on which you ride. You don't care to identify with your horse, do you? You see, but at the same time, people do. So we're going to talk about the threefold flame and identity, and we want to point out that man's life is in actuality a flame. You probably have not thought of yourself as a flame. And therefore, I want you to think of yourself as a flame. Because when you, in this audience, start to think of yourself as a flame, you will be involved in a bit of temple magic. And this temple magic is white magic, not black magic. And it is essentially a valuable experience in defining reality. The electronic nature of the universe is quite apparent to us. That is if we're discerning. Science has given us great insight in recent years as to the power electricity plays in many of the functions of life. But now we have to realize that we ourselves are a bit electronic and that we are a vibratory creation not a creation that is static and stands still without movement, but a creation that pulsates with life. And life is God, and the scriptures say that God is a spirit. Now, if God is a spirit, and we are made in the image of God, then we too are a spirit rather than a body. The body is our overcoat. We put it on. We wear it. It carries us about. It functions, but it is not ourselves. We are a flame, and we are a tripartite flame. That is, a three-part flame. Now, in modern video transmission, you will probably, if you study it a little, notice that in colored video transmission, we make use of three primary colors. This happens to be a part of the color spectrum. And by using it properly, we are able to bring in almost all the tones of life on this television screen that we can bring into manifestation in the world of art and the world around us in our environment. So, now we're going to find out that the flame that we are is three parts, that the parts have colors and qualities with the colors that the color of pink and blue and yellow is involved here. And that is the threefold flame of our identity. On this chart of the presence and the causal body and the Holy Christ Self, the descending dove from the Father to the Son, through the heart of the great Christ Self, we see the paraclete here or the Holy Spirit, descending on the head of finite man, we see finite man here with a circle drawn in the chest cavity. 
And there we see three plumes. One is pink, one is yellow, and one is blue. These three plumes are the plumes of identity and qualitatively, not quantitatively, but qualitatively, they manifest through the pink, the quality of divine love. Through the yellow, they manifest the quality of divine wisdom. And through the blue, they manifest the quality of the will of God. Now, I do not care how scientific you are or how intellectual you are or how many masters or teachers you may have studied under. You can never change these unalterable basic truths of the universe and the color relationships that we are describing to you. The blue is correlated to the will of God and Mary, the mother of Jesus, that is so often depicted with the blue veil over her, is actually manifesting her service as the handmaid of God. I submit, I obey thee, I do thy will, O God. Salita Lindo. The blue sky. Overhead we have the blue sky. It covers the earth. And unless it is obscured by clouds, we always see it in the daytime, a blue sky. Some parts of the world where we have a lot of smog and aerial refuse, this sky is washed out. It doesn't look very good. Here in Colorado, where we have a relatively pure air, similar to the air at Darjeeling, India, we have this beautiful blue sky. And actually, it is to remind us of the will of God. Because we always think of the blue sky as good. If a sky is blue... We are pleased. People remark again and again about the blue sky here in Colorado. And they like it, but they do not know why they like it. They like it because it relates to the will of God. And people inherently, because of the affinity of the flame that they are, really desire to relate to the will of God. We will find out, if we are very careful to watch through this class, that deliberately intentional destroying mechanisms have tried to tear a man away from his natural self, his real self, his cosmic identity, his cosmic affinity, to pull him down just like you'd put dirty water down a drain. But that's not God's plan for us. There are what we will call spirits of darkness that depend on stealing light from us. They want to vampirize us. They want to take our energy because they have none of their own. They cannot get it from God because they have rebelled against him. And the only way they can get it is from people. And the more discord people throw out, the more jangle in the world, the longer these can survive in the astral world, the longer the life that they have. And their tenure will run out when human beings become perfect. The moment man starts loving his neighbor as himself, at that very moment, there will be no possibility of their stealing any more light from people. And they will fade away into the nothingness that they are because they have no real reality. But as we give them power through accepting their negative feelings about other people or our destiny, about our nation or other nations, about anyone. The moment we accept these ideas, they become real to us and we act accordingly. So we must be aware of the wisdom flame because it is not just enough to have intelligence, although intelligence carries within its own word structure the true meaning of intelligence, the intelling of God, which should make gents out of us, shouldn't it? We should be a little bit more diplomatic if we have the intelling of God coming into us. You know, intelligence? Well, you didn't get that one. <laughs> anyway, this is the way it is at Pumpkin Center as well as Colorado Springs, everywhere in the world. 
that intelligence as man measures it by his diploma and his fraternal associations, by his class distinctions, this does not guarantee to him that he is going to have wisdom along with his intelligence. How many men and women have you seen who were, so to speak, loaded to the gills with worldly wisdom, who could not function in an executive capacity at all and failed the first time they were put on trial and ever thereafter? And how many people like Henry Ford have you seen who, with very little education, were able to take command of a vast empire and develop it? So you see, while intelligence must not be spoken of disparagingly, for certainly, under God's guidance, the intellect was intended to be cultivated. It must not become a substitute for genuine wisdom, which is developed by experience and by compassion. So, the Christ mind is the yellow plume, and we find these flames interpenetrate our being. We have the Christ mind with its vast cosmic intelligence storehouse. We have the love of God that never reflects upon a man's bank account or any of his possessions in determining to render him a service. God is the great giver and the flame is the great giver of life to us all. As we will find out, the flame imparts life to us. It does not take from us. And we, made in his image, if we are to remain in his image or to function in God's image, we cannot be vampires. We cannot be predatory creatures preying on one another with base motivations. We must, if we are to emulate the Christ, emulate him in the thought of service, completely unmotivated. The old story has been told, and I've often smiled over it myself, about the bank president. A man said that he could always tell who were the prominent people in town by sitting in the bank and watching the people come in and listening to the bank president greet them. Morning, Miss Jones. Hello there, Bill. How are you? Mr. Smith, and a few nods here and a few nods there. He knew the size of their bank account of these people just by the way the bank president greeted them. There is no motivation in God. He doesn't look at the size of your bank account. He doesn't even look at the size of your causal body. In fact, from what I know of God, he sometimes looks at the most anemic weak and sickly creatures in his kingdom because he thinks they need his love more. And this is true. And we should be a little bit that way, but we have got to learn, and I'm not saying that God should learn this, but I'm saying that we should learn this. We have got to learn that there is a time to let certain segments of life learn to stand on their own two feet. There is one problem involved in this, as we'll perhaps cover in the social gospel, where people become overly sympathetic to elements of life that are not willing to assume the responsibility for their own God-given opportunities. And we pour out our love and our service to them as we do sometimes to foreign countries and we receive back a slap in the face and a curse for our efforts. And this is true. Therefore, as people that value divine judgment, we must learn also to understand when to give and when to withhold of ourselves. And sometimes, Allah the divine, we must learn to chasten other people in order that we might demonstrate our love by chastening as well as at other times lavishing our affection upon them. But God give us the wisdom to know when to do this. Otherwise, we could create a tremendous karma, you see, by reversing this process, just turning it upside down. And when in doubt, give a little. But don't give everything, because you could be wrong on that, you see. 
So, we are covering love that is not involved in the vampire activity of human sympathy where it is pulled upon because people want you to feel sorry for them. I do not say that we should not pray for such as these. I think they need a great deal of prayer. But they must reach up. They must make an effort to find reality themselves. Man know thyself is a fiat of the great white brotherhood. Man has got to come to the point where he makes self-intelligent effort to find his divine presence. I am convinced that from the beginning God was literally dumping himself on humanity, that he was drenching people with his love, but that they did not respond. And I am convinced that out of his own wisdom he gradually withdrew because he realized that this was not the answer. It was not the answer of just giving and giving and giving of himself and his gifts. But there was an element of true stewardship involved here where the steward had to learn the value of his talents and prove unto the deity before deity would open the windows of heaven to him. There are schools today that teach of the abundance of God and how he would lavish it upon them. But we must look practically not to one life or to just a few segments of lives, but we must look to the total world picture. We must also look with the wisdom eyes of the great white brotherhood and we must realize that God has only withdrawn from man as a tactical maneuver calculated to arouse in him a hunger for this great reality that God is. Because when God was close to man, and when he is drawn the closest to man, sometimes people have failed to appreciate him. Now, I want to point something out about the flow of the flame. I want to point out that the flame of reality that is in the heart is very, very small in most of humanity. And this flame is not visible under normal circumstances to the physical eyes of man. And it is probably no higher than an eighth or a quarter of an inch in the heart chambers. In case of transplants, I assure you that the flame remains with the individual because it is a part of the etheric rather than of the physical. Therefore, these silly questions, which I really shouldn't call silly, but nevertheless, they seem a bit silly at times. They come in, they want to know what happens now if I have a heart transplant. Well, I don't know the number of letters we've been getting. You'd think that half the people in the organization were wondering about whether they're going to have a heart transplant or not. But actually, that is not the case. In the case of a heart transplant, the threefold flame, of course, remains with the individual I've said before because it's a part of the etheric. In fact, all of the organs of the body are only a manifestation of the physical. And if you do a transplant in any organ, you still have your same etheric record. This is something that medical science is going to find out about one of these days. If you do a, a kidney transplant, the record of your other kidney will remain in your etheric body. There will be an overtone of the uh, donor kidney, of course. It will show a vibration. But unless the conditions that created the diseased organ in the first place are corrected, eventually we would see a manifestation of the same disease in most cases coming back into the physical in due course of time. Because the electronic pattern is actually that which holds the karmic record, you see. It has to be, you can't change it. So this flame flows and it flows very minutely. And one of the activities and functions of the Keepers of the Flame fraternity and of the Summit Lighthouse itself as an organization and agency of the Great White Brotherhood is the teaching of the methods of increasing the flow of this flame so that it becomes larger and larger. In fact, we have seen people whose plume of love was so large that it stood outside of their physical form and spilled over on the side where the wisdom ray came way up above them like this and then the blue plume came out like that on the other side. So seeing this is the reason for the activity is to increase this threefold flame, it means that we are seeking the expansion of the reality of the individual. 
because you are not your body, but you are this flame. Now, at first, of course, this may seem a bit uncomfortable to some people who have always thought of themselves as the body, and they can't imagine looking in the mirror and seeing this flame in the mirror. In fact, they'd probably be frightened and run out the door if they saw the flame. But actually, it's just like this. Whatever environment you are in, there is an adaptability in your consciousness. It's just like in the matter of the spherical body as described in one of our advanced lessons. I mean, it's the same with a child in the womb. The child is curled up in the womb. And it's perfectly comfortable in this natural environment, warm and cozy in a fluid like a fish. Very happy there. So happy they kick and bounce and can hardly wait to come forth and they have even been heard to cry. Did you know that? They've been heard to cry inside the womb, make noise with their mouth. So this is a rather interesting thing because the fetus itself is really, of course, the embryonic adult male or female body. And once again, we see that it is not this little miniature creation that is actually the child, but it is a threefold flame. And it conveys and carries identity. You go and talk to some of the nurses sometime up in the maternity wards. They can tell you some real stories like this. They'll say, every baby has a distinct and different personality. Well, is this hereditary? I mean, was it mama and papa through their genes and chromosomes that put this personality in? Is this a, just a manifestation of chemical elements and so forth? Of course not. It's a manifestation of the soul. And the soul is different. The soul personality is different. It's naturally different. Because people are different, let's face it. Yet they all have the same potential. Now getting back to the pattern of the threefold flame again, it has a flow and the flow must be increased. And I want to point out something strange to you about this threefold flame. When we look at it frontally, we see it, it looks almost like a Boy Scout emblem similar to the fleur de lis. But if we look at it from on top, if we come right down on top of it, it looks like three balls in a pawn shop. I mean from the top as you look down on it. Because we are dealing here with spheres, three spheres, and attached to the spheres is sort of a gradually receding root structure. It isn't really a root, it's part of the flame, but it comes down, you see. So, this gives us a little different vision of it. Well, if you stand on one side of the flame, it may look a little different than the other. Do you see that from the standpoint of the three ball, you're looking down on top of it? Depends on what relationship your body is and your eyes are to the position of the flame. If the flame is not moving, it's just stationary, you can get all kinds of different angles to it, you see which will reverse the process, won't it? But you should be aware of the right and left in relationship then only to your own physical body because you will find that the hemisphere of the brain, that the left side of the brain, when it is affected as in strokes and paralysis and so forth, it will affect the right side of the body. And it's always reversed. And this is an interesting concept, but it's true. It's just like the optical images that we see. In reality, all of the people in this room in my eye are upside down. You're all hanging by your heads. But my brain reverses it in my consciousness. Now, I want to try to explain to you in connection with this flame something about the personal id. The personal id, the identity, the self, has no connection with this flame, basically. Because the flame is the identity of the Father within you. Do you understand me? I mean, this is the Christ identity of man. And that is what we must cultivate. We have to cultivate the flame identity because the human personality is constantly changing. Do you understand that? It's constantly changing. 
people will absolutely change from the time they're babies till the time they're five years old. And they change when they're 10 years old. They change when they're 15. They change when they're 20. And then when they become 21 and they grow up, Then they change again, and they change all the way through life, and they're constantly changing. People are in a constant state of flux, mental flux. And it's really something. But people get rooted and wedded to this changing personality, and they think that's themselves. And they cherish it because they don't understand it. And we'll try to give you some insight into it as quickly as possible here. The personal id actually equals the Akashic records of all embodiments you have ever had. In other words, the personal identity of you is involved with every one of your embodiments back to the time you first set foot upon this planet. Therefore, naturally, seeing you've probably been kings, queens, serfs, and bartenders, as well as everything else, <laughs> black guards and pirates, Heaven only knows what. I mean, you do have within you the demons of many of these negative creations. And these, of course, must be transmuted by the student because they are the shadow and the smoke that was referenced by God to Abraham when he said to him, the burning and smoking lamp will pass before you. And the burning is necessary because this shows transmutation. The smoke comes up because we are having combustion. And we are having combustion because we had something to burn. And whether you realize what I'm saying or not, this is actually the constructive aspects of what men have called hellfire and brimstone. It's the burning out by the divine process without harm to the personality at all of the elements that need transmuting. Why, I can go to anybody in this room and say to them, have you ever done anything wrong? And any honest person here will admit to having done wrong. And when they admit it, they will say, well, I don't want that in my world. Well, you've got it in your world. It's in your world if you did it. And you've got to clean it up. Everybody does. If it were not so, all of the messiahs we have seen down through the ages would have saved the world a long time ago. We'd now be living in a golden age of peace and harmony between everyone. The very fact that we are not shows that failure has occurred. But it is not total failure, it's only partial failure. It's the kind of failure that shows we're trying. And it means that we should sweep aside and say skidoo to a lot of the erroneous thoughts and philosophies that have tried to deceive us with a childlike religion. And when I say childlike, I don't mean it constructively. I'm not saying that childlike. A lot of time when I say childlike, I think it's very sweet. But I'm saying childish, and that's the word I should have used. A childish religion that actually thinks that the Heavenly Father sits up here somewhere in an antiseptic corner of the universe with a big white beard like on the Sistine Chapel, I think he's sitting up there looking down on the earth and saying, well, you're going down and you're going up and, and I'm arbitrarily going to decide. It's like a game of Daisy. She loves me, she loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, and so on. That God is just whimsically deciding that he's going to choose this one or that one. That is not the case. We have to choose God as the masters have taught and we have to compound deity within ourselves alchemically. We have to transfer deity, and we have to transmute, and we have to refine. And this is the wonderful Christ process, whereby with the will, tethered to the divine will, we are able to manifest reality for ourselves. Otherwise, you see, it would never work. Now then, the flame is will, wisdom, power of perfection. All of that is inherent within the flame. The carnal mind and its acts, untransmuted or unchanged, enters life and leaves its record on the lower being of man in the liver. In the liver, this is correct. The liver is a sewer, and the life records of human beings are actually recorded in the liver. That's what it means, liver, life record. See, in the old sense, our tongue. 
See? Live record. See? See? It's true. Now the Christ mind, the Christ mind is different than this lower life record. And the Christ mind always carries people up. Now then, what is the real id, the real identity of man? This is where we've got to walk the razor's edge, and this is the most important point I'm trying to make to you. A lot of people want to abolish this lower identity, and they are wrong. They cannot abolish it. It is a carte blanche to heaven if they use it right and don't abuse it. God could have made us angels being subjected to his will like puppets. We would be programmed like computers. We'd fly through heaven, and we'd carry out the divine mandates. And eventually we might even come to the point where we created in ourselves a certain degree of his love. But in the meantime, we would carry his love. We'd be angels. Human beings made a little lower than the angels are going to be crowned with more glory because they will come through the crucible of suffering and God will be born in them. They will have their own Bethlehem, their own nativity. The straw in the manger of their heart will repose there and on that straw the little miniature Christ self as an extension of the higher Christ self, the natural cosmic Christ, the miniature Christ self as a flame is blazing there within the heart. And the identity of man is a fusion. The real identity is a fusion of the lower personality and a merge where the lower personality gradually lays off that which is corruptible and puts on that which is incorruptible. And eventually, the lower self, as above, so below. The lower self becomes God-identified. This is what a master does. This is what a master is. This is what you're all aspiring to, to be ascended masters. And this is your God plan. God did not create you to turn you into pirates, thieves, blackguards, and every other kind of ill-begotten personality manifestation. God created you to be his only begotten son, to be in the image of that son. Do you see the point? And the whole human race was created that way, gloriously created. And so, in closing, I'd like to say that the real id is a composite of the Christ mind and the emerging human personality as it is glorified by light. And to wind it up, this is a daily process. And we will touch upon many of these things and reintegrate them and rephrase them and clarify them as the class proceeds. But we did want to touch a bit on the threefold flame in your identity because while you may not, some of you may not even understand what I've said, there are some of you that won't understand it because you haven't thought of yourself this way. Yet, on the other hand, biological science is now coming out with possibilities of transplanting human heads even and putting them into a machine and then wondering whether the soul will enter in. You see what I mean? And they could keep people alive just inside their brain. And eventually this brain would just sit there in space and be aware of all things through some scientific apparatus that could be constructed. We don't want that. Others are freezing corpses. They're freezing them in the hopes that in a thousand years from now that they will be able to take care of the cancer they have or the heart condition. All these things. We are not looking to science or the earth for our immortality. We are satisfied with the disintegration process because we know that we have an integration process while we are here that if we follow it out to the fullest degree we will achieve our immortality and that without any question. There isn't any two ways about it. The masters have gone before. And any person that doubts the master's authenticity or reality can very easily, in the course of time, prove to themselves again and again the reality of the masters. I'm not going to do it this minute. You're not going to receive it this minute. 
but it is a provable process. And when we see that process, we realize our divine identity is our immortality. And we realize that in this changing ephemeral manifestation, we do not have immortality, but mortality. There is a fraternity in this country that as part of their ceremonies has people sit before a mirror and look at their own embodiments. I'm not criticizing the process, but I'm sure that all of us could go back and back and back and see ourselves as Sufis, see ourselves in Ur, see ourselves in Babylon, and as Risa Stevens did, see ourselves in the Colosseum or elsewhere in the world. We might proceed to examine the fabric of all these embodiments. But as far as I am concerned, I'm looking to the future because these are all root structures feeding the present. And what we are concerned with is what we shall be. For when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Thank you.